Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity you have given to us to come to you and to have this Bible study on abiding in Christ, abiding in Christ. Now we hand over to you and your Holy Spirit, Almighty God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, will teach us in the name of Jesus. Sweet Holy Spirit, you are our helper, you are our teacher, you are our counselor. Teach us the word of God, the word of truth now, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, one more time, welcome. So, we want to continue uh, with our study on abiding in Christ, abiding in Christ. Glory be to God. Our text is from John chapter 15, verse 5. John chapter 15, verse 5. Please, I would like you to open your Bible to John chapter 15, verse 5, and read it with me. If you can even open the line to read along, it will be good. I will appreciate that. So um, if you are there, Let's read it together. John chapter 15, verse 5. That is our text. Let's go. I am the vine. You, you are, are the branches. He who, who abides in me, in me and, and I, I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Glory be to God. We started this study uh, last week. And from this text, we can bring out a number of key uh, messages or key points. Number one, the vine, who is Jesus Christ. In verse one of this same chapter, Jesus is called a true vine. So the vine or the true vine is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, we also see abider in the vine. Abider in the vine, because he says, he who abides in me and I in him. So abider in the vine, abider in the vine. Abider in the vine is one, therefore, who is a fruit bearer. So we see also fruit bearer. Abider in the vine is a fruit bearer, a fruit bearer. We also see non-abider in the vine, non-abider in the vine, non-abider in the vine. And a non-abider in the vine is also a nothing bearer. So we've got the vine, hallelujah, and we've got Abider in the vine, who is a fruit bearer. And we've also got a non-abider in the vine, who is a nothing bearer. For he said in that text, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. So those are the key words from that verse, and we'll be looking at this. I think as we go through this important thing is to really ask yourself, am I a abider in the vine? And if I am, if I say to myself, I'm a abider in the vine, where are the fruits? Because a abider in the vine bears much fruit, is fruit bearer is fruit bearer. A brother made a statement last time which I have tried to raise higher because he said that the degree of the fruit we bear depends on what we are being fed, said what we are being fed. The kind of fruit we bear or we bring forth depends on what we are being fed. And I put it this way, because it's a simple principle that output depends on input. We know that that's the point he is making. Output depends on input or the other way around. 
input determines output. So the fruit we bear de depends on how we are abiding in the vine. So in part one, which we took previous Sunday, we dealt with what does it mean to abide in Christ? What does it mean to abide in Christ? We realized that this was about Jesus and his disciples. This text was about Jesus and his disciples. So to abide in Christ ultimately means one's personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To abide in Christ means ultimately one's personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ? What is my personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus used this illustration of the relationship between the vine and the branches to teach us this important lesson. While he was speaking directly to his disciples who were there with him, this is very relevant to us today. In fact, even more relevant. Because at that point, as we mentioned last Sunday, Jesus was preparing to go to the cross, to die, to depart from this world. And he was preparing his disciples. Those who saw Jesus physically. Now, we are of faith. We are of faith who have come to believe this truth. And Jesus says, abide in me. Have this relationship with me. For without me, you can do nothing. It is your level of relationship that determines how much you know Jesus Christ, your work with him, and the level of fruit you bear in life. I say that again. It is your level of relationship that determines how much you know Jesus Christ, your work with him, and the level of fruit you bear in life. He said, he that abides in me will bear much fruit. He that abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, much there, does give a sense of very, very, various level and degree of bearing fruit. And that's why we make that very important point, that it is your level of relationship that determines how much you know Jesus Christ, your walk with him, and the level of fruit you bear in life. Colossians 1.27, we know that scripture, says Christ in you, the hope of glory. So how much glory of Christ do you want to radiate in life? Glory be to God. So today we want to look deeply at this relationship. And we want to pose the question again, what is my level of relationship with Jesus Christ? That is my level of abiding in Christ. Since abiding in Christ ultimately is about relationship with Jesus Christ. What is my relationship, my level of relationship with Jesus Christ? That is my level of abiding in Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So we want to take this now. And we want to start because we already listed the level of relationship. In human terms, we know those that relate together. So we mentioned a number of them. We talked about servants, servants. Servants are in relationship with their master. And you would see that in verse uh, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. 
So we see servants there. Number two, we see friends is also there, friend. Another level of relationship, human relationship is friend. And then number three, we go to spouse. We go to spouse, husband or wife, husband or wife. And then number four, we go to son or daughter, son or daughter. So we're talking about children. We will go in this order. So let's start our discussion with servant, the relationship of servant. Um, so why you want to contribute on that, you may just speak generally about all the others that you have prepared. So I don't constrain your thought process. So let's now go for it. I will ask Sister Comfort to start the discussion. It's Bible study. Good morning, my uh, brothers in Christ Jesus. Morning, ma. I love the word. Let me beginning from what you said. Said our relationship, the level of our relationship with Jesus Christ determines the fruit we bear. So how much fruit we bear determines the relationship with the uh, uh, our relationship with Jesus Christ. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, and you have also said, depending on what you have been fed on, your fruits, you will also determine, okay, what you are being fed on will also determine the kind of fruits you bear. Yes. So that is, is being confirmed by what, um, uh, the scripture says at John, I think 8.32, it says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I, everyone, why I'm happy about this platform is this opportunity of allowing us to search the scripture and find out what the scripture says. So that based on what we know, guided by the Holy Spirit, then we will know what is the truth from where we should uh, build our relationship on. Because if, if it is not the truth, you will see, yes. But one thing I like about God is he's a faithful father. Yes. Hebrew says what? He is or not unrighteous, so as to forget your work and the love you show for his name. Yeah. So God knows what you do, you know, and he knows what you will say and what where you are coming from. So please, my I um I I really like how the, the that John chapter 15, verse 1. I think first one and two, that was where I was really built my focusing on to know what fruits we will bear. First one and two say, Jesus said it clearly. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruits. So I look at that verse one. Then I, I, I did a, a map. So can I, just, I can I just check something with you? Yes. Does your Bible say fruits as plural or singular? Because mine is singular and and sorry, fruits, 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 yeah, fruits. I'm sorry, so bear all fruits through, all through. So let's let's take that point because that's very important in studying this uh, this portion, this very message. It mm -hmm. is fruit, not fruits. Mm. It is fruit. Okay, go ahead, please. 
Okay. So like you have rightly said, so I, I was so uh, happy to see what Jesus make it to understand that if he is divine and we have a vine dresser, some texts say a gardener, some said husbandman. So, and this gardener is the father and he's ready to prune us. That means God draws us to Jesus Christ and Jesus now being the vine, help us if we build the relationship with Jesus Christ, God will now refine us, help us to bear the right fruits that will help us to abide in Christ and be in union with Christ and receive the blessings that all those who follow Christ will enjoy, which is life everlasting. Thank you, thank you. Thank um, you for that contribution. Life everlasting, the ultimate result of this abiding in Christ. Thank you for that contribution. So we'll try to again focus. So the question is, what? is or what are the different relationships we've mentioned four of them and we want a discussion on this relationship if there is any other type of relationship you know you mention it because it's important to understand how we are relating with jesus christ the vine how we are relating is very important. So what are the different types of relationship? That's what we're looking at. We say that it is your level of relationship that determines how much you know Jesus Christ, your work with him, and the level of fruit you bear in life. Uh, it's the, 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 the fruit we're talking about here, I think our sister has elaborated on the fruit part. So you can almost qualify it godly fruit, <laughs> amen. <laughs> Glory be to God. So we're looking at what is my level of relationship with Jesus Christ? And we've mentioned four categories of relationship, servant. Uh, next, we talk about friends. We talk about spouse. We talk about children, son, stroke, daughter. If there is any other one, please mention. But let me make a point here that you should understand because at times when we are, you know, uh, talking to, 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 to the Lord, we kind of mix up his office and roles that he plays in our lives with our relationship with him. So for example, somebody may tell me that, oh, Jesus is my high priest. So what relationship, what is my relationship with him? You're right. You know, that his high, his, Jesus being your high priest is an office that Jesus occupies on your behalf. You understand now, yeah? So uh, I will come back to that, but I hope you get the point. Uh, so uh, for instance, he is our king, right? He's our king. But well, that's an office that he occupies. The relationship simply comes down to these four levels. Okay, if there is no other um, uh, relationship other than these four that anybody wants to add, then let's talk about this. Uh, any one of these you want to discuss? Servant, two, friend, three. Because there are very important things around this relationship that we need to know. Uh, three, spouse, and four, son or daughter. Looking at the relationship between us and God, I want to look at the angle of the father and son or father and daughter's relationship. Our relationship with God must be built on trust. We must believe in the ability of God to handle our situation. When you have someone that is close to you, you look at the person and you trust the person. You know that no matter the circumstance, no matter what you are passing through, because of that trust that has been established between you and that person, you believe that the person will be able to do what he says he will do. 
God made promises to us. When we believe in him and we trust in him and we have confidence in him, that relationship and we abide in it, that promise will definitely come to pass in our life. I want to use an analogy of myself and my daughter. When my daughter was very young, I took her to the top of my car. I placed her there. I asked her to jump from the car to me. She looked at me. She was smiling. I said, jump. She was smiling. Later, she, she left and I caught her. Why? Because she believed in me. Because she was so sure that if she jumped, I would definitely crash her. And she would not fall and injure herself. It was that confidence that made her to jump. And behold, I heard her and caught her and we laughed. So that should be our relationship with God. We should have confidence in God that because we are part of the vine, we will definitely bear fruit. We have the confidence that if we establish a relationship with him and we walk in accordance, of, in accordance with his word, we will definitely bear fruit in our life. That confident relationship, that trust and dependability we have is what builds on our relationship and when we move in line with these things, whatever promises he has made concerning us, and we have implicit confidence on his word, those promises will definitely come to pass. So looking at the relationship between the far, father and the child, there's a confidence-building relationship. So also, we should build our confidence with God as our father and have trust in his word. And this confidence we have in it will build our stronger relationship, will build a stronger relationship between we and himself. And that will take us to different heights. And again, we should look at the aspect of God being able to prune us. When my daughter misbehaved, I flogged her. And I explained to her the reason why I flogged her, as she understand. In the same way, too, as the grace is dear for us, as we trust in him, the situation whereby God will want to prune us as we are abiding in, the situation where he will prune us so that we become better Christian. And as he keeps on pruning us, this keeps on, this pruning makes us to bear fruit and he builds our, and he builds a stronger relationship with him. And that trust is built continually. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lucky, for that contribution. Um, talking on uh, the relationship between the father and children, father and children relationship, son and daughter, or son or daughter. Thank you. Sister Gertrude, I will call you. Please go ahead. We can hear you now. Okay. I, I was reading from John chapter 13. It says, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. And then verse 16, you, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I will stop there. So I want to talk about relationship, the relationship we should have with Jesus. He has upgraded it from being servant master relationship to being friends. And he has told us from these verses that first, a friend lays down his life for his friend. He has laid down his life for us. And because Jesus has laid down his life for us, we are now reconciled to the Father. So we are now children of God. So as friends, we have to be connected to him. We are children of God. And then what does a friend hurt me? But we want to obey and do what I say. So as friends of Jesus, we obey his word, his command, because he has given up his life for us. So <laughs> we should obey his commands and live in his love. And that as a friend, there is confidence. He confides in us. He tells us what the father has told him. So it's such a privilege that as friends of Jesus, he confides in us what the father has told him. 
he tells us, because we are not servants again. Servants don't know much about their masters. They only do their command, but we, we know what is in the heart of Jesus and we obey. I think that's where I will stop. And because we are friends, he has chosen us. And he has chosen us to bear fruit and fruit that would last. That is very, very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gertrude. Yes, uh, you've mentioned a number of good points there. You talk about being upgraded. We upgrade, I love that word, upgraded from servant to friend. And then link that back also with, um, he laid down his life. And that brings us to uh, children of God. So two levels of upgrade there that Jesus has made, upgrading servant to friend and then upgrading uh, to children of God. We'll look at that as we now take it holistically and then we'll have further discussion. So again, let's emphasize that um, if we don't come to this personal appreciation of our position in God, and also take personal responsibility to work our relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ, then um, we may not enjoy the fullness of what we're expected to enjoy in life as children of God. So this is very important for us to understand. So let's start with servant, and let's look at it. Glory be to God. <laughs> Who is a servant? Let me say pointedly that there is no Christian that is a servant as per relationship. Hear that and hear that clearly. There is no Christian Nobody that has been saved by Jesus Christ that is a servant. So that's why it's good for us to appreciate these things. But let's not again contradict this, mixed it up. When we as ministers of Christ who are serving use the word servant, so there we are talking about our service, not our relationship. You must be very clear about this. So there is no Christian that is a servant in terms of relationship. So who is a servant? This is the lowest level of relationship in God or with God, you see? So sometimes people think, oh, yeah, I'm a servant of God. And that makes you, oh, really, really deep in relationship. No, that's the lowest level. And that's what I really want to spend time treating because the, the other two are simple. And then we will spend a lot of time in children. And we may not be able to finish children today. We'll follow it up because it requires responsibility. So who is a servant? or? Who are servants? You know. Those who simply serve the specific duty as spelled out by the master. Note that point. Servants are those who serve the specific duty of the master. They have no rights or heritage in the family. They have no right in or heritage in the family. So servants come, they are given specific duty to please the master, and they do that. They cannot hold on to anything, any right. They don't have any right or heritage in the family. So you can see why no Christian can be a servant in terms of relationship. They have no genetical relationship with the family. That's point two. And then point three, 
very important to note, they are paid reward for their service as agreed with the master. They are paid for their service. You know the illustration Jesus gave about a vine owner who went out to hire laborers and he hired some at the ninth hour like that and in the 11th, sixth hour, ninth hour and the 11th hour, he went out and hired them. And when the time came, he paid them their reward. So, laborers are paid their rewards. Now, this is this one I want us all to really remember. The servant will live once their tenure ends or their service are no longer, services are no longer required. The servant will leave once their tenure ends or their services are no longer required. If we look at John chapter eight, verse 35 in the King James version, and I want us to probably read a few more of uh, verses. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abided ever. Praise the Lord. And if we take this scripture all the way from verse 31, you see something there. It say, then said Jesus to those Jews, to whom those Jews, that's very instructive, which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's what my sister Comfort quoted this same passage. Free from what? What was Jesus saying here? He said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Free from the law. Because a servant is given rules, regulations to perform just that task. There is no relationship of, I mean, no genetical relationship. The only relationship is that of a servant, that of a slave to do duties for the master. So for a servant or slave, the other person is who? Master. Verse 33, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Therefore, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. So all sinners can at best be servant. They have not come into the branch. They can only be servant. You know, God uses anybody. That's where I'm trying to bring out. So God used those who were under the law for a purpose. And God can use anybody as a servant. But a servant does not belong to the family, does not have any heritage in the family. It's very important to bear this in mind. If you look at uh, Hebrews 3.5, Hebrews 3.5, please, Sister Comfort, you can open Hebrews 3, 3, 5, another person, Numbers 12, 7. It's the same scripture. Hebrews 3, 5 says, And Moses indeed was, a fit, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. Hello, continue. But Christ as a son, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Amen. So Amen. you could see there the servant. So oh, if you go to Galatians 3, and I will encourage us all to read through Galatians 3. So anyone that is still under the law, that have not come into the grace remains a servant. They may do some good things, 
but they remain servant. And they are still under sin. That's the point. Because they have no heritage or right in the family and have not been washed with the precious blood of Jesus. Let's move to friend. Our sister rightly said, upgraded to friend. Yes, so a servant can be upgraded to a friend who is a friend. Again, a friend has not a genetical, he has no genetical relationship, but deliberate choice of goodness. So in friendship, there is a choice. And that's why in John chapter 15 that we read, you see that Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I choose you and appointed you that you should go be a fruit. As who now? As friends, upgrading servant to friend. So friendship is a deliberate choice and you have to choose to be a friend of Jesus. It is friends, I, I often make this statement that friendship is not mere sanctimonious um, association. It's not by mere san sanctimonious association, rather. It's not by mere sanctimonious association. That's the fact that you are in the house with people doesn't mean everybody there will be friends. It's by choice. Hear that word, it's by choice. It requires some responsibility to make friendship happen. So Jesus here said, I choose you. Friendship is by choice. Though there were servants, he said, I choose you. I make you friends. And one key thing to remember about friends or a friend is that a friend, key point about a friendship or a friend, this relationship is that a friend knows a lot. A friend knows a lot of secrets. Sometimes a friend knows, not sometimes, most times, a friend knows far more than a child. And this is what is going on. Some, a father will have a business and have a partner, his friend, that is a partner with him. The partner will know everything about that business, but the children in the house know nothing. Even though they are the right people to inherit that business. No wonder there are lots of problems. Because at times, when that man, that woman, that uh, sister is no, no longer there, the friend who knew everything takes everything away. And so, a friend knows a lot of secrets, but still does not have heritage in the family, but knows a lot and can take a lot because of what he knows. Now we move to spouse. Uh, so verses 13 and 15, 13 to 15, and then verse 16 that we read talks a lot about friends. I, I can we can refer to a whole lot of others. But the key point is that friendship is by choice. And a friend knows a lot of secrets about the other friend. The third point is to remember that there is a responsibility of building friendship. There is work, there is action of building friendship. Now, spouse. Spouse also is not a genetic relationship. So, but why friendship is by choice? A spouse is by a covenant. So a spouse is one that you have entered into, uh, you have entered into a covenant relationship with. And this covenant relationship is based on love. It's based on love. Wow. So Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Gave himself for her. So comparison here between husband and wife as Christ also loved the church 
and gave himself for her. And of course, we've already taken in the previous study that we are the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or many, any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So the church, the body of Christ, you and I, Jesus sees us as his spouse, his wife. Jesus is our husband. And you can see the responsibility that Jesus takes here. And in the same way, he tells us, husbands, love your wives. 31. Okay, I'm sorry, 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You can see that there, 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Christ's church is the wife of Christ. That's the way Christ is the husband to his church. That's the relationship. Praise the name of the Lord. And you will also see in Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verses uh, 7 to 9. I think it's important we read that. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 to 9. What does the Bible say there? Verse 7, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. Can you see that? So the church of Jesus Christ is righteous, the body of Christ that you are. So our sister was talking about fruit. Who we'll come there? And we will understand the fruit. But let's appreciate this level of relationship as a spouse, the wife of Jesus. The one in Ephesians chapter 5, Jesus said, it is my responsibility to cleanse her, to purge her and sanctify her and make her blameless only if she comes into this covenant relationship. Remember, Mary, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the relationship of spouse is by covenant of love. Covenant of law. One key thing about this relationship, again, when you compare with a friend, is that while a friend may know some things, <laughs> the spouse knows everything, at least how it ought to be. Don't talk, we're not talking about all those people who don't know the word of God and they're not living by the word of God. But I want to challenge you now. Your spouse should know everything. The spouse knows everything. It is by covenant relationship of love. So that's the relationship we have come to have with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. And finally, the relationship of son or daughter, which we have already talked about. And I have made the point that we Christians, a Christian, we are not servant. And our sister used the word upgrade. So Jesus upgraded those who were servants, who are those under the law, to friends, in that he revealed certain things to them. But by laying down his life, for those who were merely friends, he has upgraded all, given the opportunity for all to become sons and daughters. It is by Jesus laying down his life that the price has been paid for sonship or that daughterhood. However, 
that sacrifice brings us to the place of the promise of God. What did God promise? That he will give us the Holy Spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit that makes anybody a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. Praise the name of the Lord. And so one may come into the covenant and confess Jesus, but still remain as a friend and behave like a friend and treat and, and act like a friend. Forgetting that there is a covenant that brings you to the level of a spouse. Ah, and one may even operate as a friend and operate as a spouse, but forgets that there is a relationship that makes you a son or a daughter. So put it this way, that the desire of God from time for man is to make sons and daughters unto himself. Just the way Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and God always had fellowship with them. As we've said before, when man fell, man lost that connection, separation. Sin brought that separation. And through Jesus Christ, the sin has been dealt with. And now God promised he will pour his spirit upon all flesh. Those who come to Jesus and the sin is dealt with, receive the spirit of God and then are restored to the position of sons and daughters of God. Without the Holy Spirit, nobody is a son. Nobody is a daughter of God. Romans chapter 8 emphasizes, like I said, we will go deeper then into this relationship. Romans chapter 8, let's look at it. Let's start from verse 14 and remind ourselves. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's verse 16. 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. Indeed, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be, a, a be glorified together. So here you see the son, the daughter is the head, the inheritor, has the right of everything. Glory be to God. So by the spirit of God, we have become joint heads with Jesus Christ. That's our position. If you now come back to the John chapter 15 that we were looking at, after Jesus said all this, go and see how he closed it. Let's start from 24. It says, if I, had done, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin, but now they have sinned and also hated both me and my father. So he was talking to those who were still outside, telling them, at best, they could be seven. He has come to tell them, but they are still in their sin. 25. But, is, his, but this happened that their word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law, in their law, because they are still in the law, servants. They hated me without a cause. 26. Look at 26 and 27. He said, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. 27. And you also, can you see that? Will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Praise the name of the Lord. So here Jesus brought it all together. That it is by the Holy Spirit. That is how we become sons and daughters of God. And by that power of the Holy Spirit, we, and abiding in that relationship as sons and daughters of God, we bear fruit by the Spirit. Glory be to God. Another key point to make here 
is that, as we have seen, friend knows a lot, but it is by choice. You may be a son and yet still not know much. Oh, how many children, just like we have said, are in that friendly and friendship relationship with their parents? How many parents are in that friendship and friendly relationship with their children? This is the problem. So you can be, uh, you are a son, you are a daughter, and you need to consciously know that you are under a covenant relationship as a wife of Jesus. And you have a responsibility to be a friend. Glory be to God. I want to say that again. You are a son. You are a daughter. I am a son. I am a daughter. Oh, I am a son, rather, because I'm a man. I am a son, yeah, of God. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. However, you have a responsibility to be a friend. And you have a responsibility to also know that you have a covenant relationship as a wife of Jesus. Why this is important is so you reap the full benefit. As we have said, there are children who are not friendly with their parents and there are parents who are not friendly with their children. So they don't know. I want to show you this again in the Bible as I wrap up. So you, you, you see the Bible is complete. Galatians, go with me to Galatians chapter four. Please, I really want everybody to open this one. Because when we come back to deal deeply with sonship and daughter, we're talking about you realizing the full power that is available to you. Go there and read with me. So we have said, as a son, as a daughter, you are the heir. I am the heir. We are the heirs. But look at Galatians chapter 4. He said, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a servant, from a slave. No, he is master of all. Can you see that? Now I say that the heir, the son, the daughter, as long as he is a child, remains as a child, does not differ at all from a servant, from a slave, though he is master of all. Two, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So as long as that son, that daughter remains a child, it will continue until he grows to maturity. That's what the scripture is talking about. Three, even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So a servant, even though a child, I mean, even though, yes, a child, but remains a child, a son remaining a child, who is a child? Somebody that doesn't know his or her right, doesn't take responsibility, is not mature, not standing up, not making that conscious effort to be a friend of the father, of the mother, of the parents, to relate well, to know the things of the father's house. See, for he said, but when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Six, read it with me. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father. Oh, we are sons and daughters of God. Glory be to God. And we must build the relationship and be friends and be spouse. Because there are benefits that friends reap. And there are benefits that spouses reap. Which, if a son 
doesn't build that relationship. As some children are, they don't know what the parents have, what belongs to them, and they have not taken full advantage of that right. Uh, because like we're going to number dealing with those three, friends, spouse, and a son. So the son can take full benefit and of, of that. So this sonship and building the relationship, knowing as we have already spoken, and we'll go from there into the how do we bear fruit and then also talk about the meaning of the fruit. Because now we know the relationship, we would then look at how we view the relationship. So before uh, uh, we pray, if you have not, you have seen who a servant is, a sinner is a servant. Even when they claim that God created all of us, the Bible is very clear. Those are outsiders. They may be doing something at a specific point in time. All those under the law who are still practicing. When I say practicing the law, I don't mean as a deliberate choice. I mean, that's what they know and are doing. The Bible clearly makes it clear there that and they have not come into the grace that Jesus Christ has brought. But we can be, we are sons and daughters. And we should build a relationship as friends and as spouse. And we will see how do we do this. So if you've not come into Jesus Christ, I want to pray with you. Right now, you have heard the word and you want to say, I surrender my life to Jesus. I want to pray with you as we take the discussion. Father, in the name of Jesus, pray with me and say, I repent of my sin and I come into the family of God through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord Jesus, you died for my sins. And now I confess you as my Lord. I ask Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins and give me your Holy Spirit through your son, Jesus Christ, and transform my life and help me to be a fruit that will please you and glorify you. Thank you, Almighty God, for answering my prayer, for I have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters, I am touched with the way things are going around the world. And I know that Jesus, the Bible says that we bear in our bodies the marks, the mark of Jesus. And in Galatia, uh, Revelation, I think, is it Revelation chapter 6, that the Bible say, it say that don't harm the earth till we have sealed. We have put the seal of God upon the people of God. Uh, it's chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Again, that's why I thought that uh, interuse of servant as service, because you see it a lot in the scripture, and you could be confused. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, and it continued. So, this tells us God's seal can be upon his earth. Our focus scripture this year that God gave to us is Psalm 91. Verses 7 to 10. A thousand shall fall by my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord, the Most High, who is my refuge, my dwelling place. No evil shall befall me, nor any plague come near my dwelling. Join your faith with me as we pray. Say, Heavenly Father, put your seal upon every one of us and our families that no evil will touch us in this year 2021. Heavenly Father, we agree together that you put your seal upon your, the entire body of Christ, all your children, oh God, that have come to you Jesus Christ, put your seal upon them. That in this year, 2021, 
No evil arrow, no evil plague, no sickness, no disease will take their life away. They will go through this year successfully. And they will continue and live to fulfill all of God's will for their lives. We will all go through this year successfully and we will continue and will fulfill all of God's will and purpose for our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, I want to pray and just agree with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your seal that is upon us. We bear in our bodies the marks of Jesus. And by that mark of Jesus, that blood that was shed for us, the blood of the everlasting covenant, the name of Jesus that we bear, Almighty God will pray that in this year, 2021, you will see us through, you will grant us victory in every aspect of life in the name of Jesus. According to your word, we shall not die. It's 118, verse 17. We shall not die, but we shall live to declare your works, to be a fruit and fulfill all of your will for our lives and our families in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray anyone that is sick here now, let your healing virtue flow through him or her. Any member of our families that may be sick right now, let the healing virtue of Jesus flow through him now. And so we agree in the name of Jesus, be healed. By the stripes of Jesus, be healed. Heavenly Father, whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever may be happening in the lives of all these, your children, today we ask for solution. Let every oppression of the devil cease. And Lord, we pray let your favor encompass us like a shield. Cause us to be a much fruit as we abide in Christ Jesus. Thank you, our Father and our God. In the name of Jesus. Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Brothers and sisters, thank you for your patience. We will connect again next Sunday. And but please remember, Wednesday, we will pray. We will continue to pray. See, we, don't, we have not had a lot of time to pray here. We will pray on Wednesday. So Wednesday, 6 p.m., join us as we Come together for let us pray. And when we pray, God answers our prayer. The Almighty God bless you and give you peace and joy and fulfill all your heart desires this week in Jesus' name. Bye-bye and God bless you.